everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Lear, and I am a member of the philosophy department. Um, just to say there should be two handouts going around, so keep your eye out for those coming towards you. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce um, Stephen Men, um, who is uh, sort of been an inspirational scholar for me as well as a friend. Um, Stephen um, is you know, a graduate of the University of Chicago Philosophy Department. And I think that um, he's not just sort of a, a really interesting philosopher, and that's the reason that we're honoring him here today, but he's also, I think, sort of exemplary of the kind of ideal of philosopher that the University of Chicago holds out as the one we should aspire to, though uh, very few people actually manage to achieve this goal. Stephen not only has his PhD in philosophy from Chicago, um, which he got in 1989, he also has a PhD in math from Johns Hopkins, which he got in 1985. So notice how closely they came together. He must have been doing them at the same time. Um, and here are just some titles of books that he is working on them, some more actively than others, but they all exist in some kind of draft. Um, the Aim and the Argument of Aristotle's Metaphysics, um, a book called Al-Farabi's Book of Letters and the History of the Many Senses of Being. Um, he is also has a draft of a book called Feuerbach's Theorem, an essay on Euclidean and algebraic geometry. And uh, with Calvin Normore at UCLA, he is working on a book that's going to be called Nominalism and Realism from Boethius to Hobbes. So it's just an astonishing range of um, topics that Stephen works on. Um, I mean, he claims that he doesn't really work on early modern philosophy anymore, but he certainly has seriously in the past. Ancient philosophy, everything from sort of the Zoroastrian influence on Heraclitus to work on Plato and Aristotle and on through the Stoics and to Plotinus. Um, and then his interest in early modern philosophy is, of course, not just European, but also interested in Islamic um, philosophy. So he really is um, sort of uh, has this, embodies this ideal of um, not being limited to some one narrow disciplinary area of philosophy. So um, that is part of the reason why I am very excited to have Stephen here today. He's now Associate Professor of Philosophy at McGill. Uh, please welcome me, or join me in welcoming Stephen Men. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, so I should probably start by saying that contrary to what was on the publicity, this is not a 90-minute lecture. It's a 90-minute lecture plus discussion session. The lecture itself should be about 55 minutes, I think. So um, when the organizers asked me for a title, I had no idea what talk I would give. So I followed an inspired suggestion of Michael Forster's and told them that it was on Plato and Paradox. Um, the more particular talk that I'll be giving, while it certainly is about Plato and Paradox, is more specifically called On Socrates' First Objections to the Physicists. It's about a passage in Plato's Phaedo that most of you will have read that some of you will have read many, many times, but that is usually dismissed too quickly. I want to show that with more care, we can get more out of this text, that it can shed light on larger themes of the Phaedo, and indeed on larger themes of Greek philosophy. Now there are, as Gabriel said, two handouts. Uh, one page is the crucial passage from the Phaedo, and then there should be three sides, maybe it's two stapled pages. Um, which are a number of texts and useful things that I'll be referring to, and uh, you really do need that handout to follow the talk. So, the character Socrates in the Phaedo gives a series of arguments for the immortality of the soul. First, he argues that as what is dead comes from what is living, so what is living must come from what is dead, an incarnate from a discarnate soul, since if the change occurred only in one direction, eventually everyone would be dead. That doesn't seem to impress anyone as a sufficient argument, so he gives a second argument from recollection. But that argument could show only that the soul has existed before this life, not that it will also continue to exist afterward. So he supplements it with a third argument from resemblance. The soul resembles the objects of intellectual thought, which are purely unitary and therefore imperishable. 
while the body resembles the objects of sensation, which are non-unitary and can therefore perish by being decomposed into their many constituents. At this point, both Simeus and Cebes raise objections. Simeus objects that the soul may be related to the body as the harmony or attunement is to the lyre. We might want to say that the harmony is more divine than the lyre, that it resembles the imperishable more than the lyre does, but nonetheless, it can't exist without the lyre, and when the lyre perishes, it perishes too. Cebes objects that the soul may be related to the body as a weaver is to the cloaks which he weaves and some of which he wears himself. The weaver resembles the imperishable more than any individual cloak does. He has a longer life expectancy than it has, but nonetheless, he too will eventually perish in and before the last cloak that he has woven for himself. So too, the soul might last through many incarnations, but still perish with or even before its last body. Now, while most modern readers take Simeus' objection to be the more serious one, Socrates thinks that it's Cebes' objection that requires the really profound rethinking. There's a diagram of all this on the uh, second handout. He tells Cebes that answering his objection involves examining the questions about the causes of coming to be and ceasing to be. And a few lines later, he adds also the causes of being. Right, most obviously, it's about the causes of ceasing to be. These questions are investigated in the discipline called Periphysios Hysteria, natural history or physics, and Socrates gives an allegedly autobiographical account of his difficulties with his discipline, which serves in effect as a series of objections to the physicist's approach to these questions and serves ultimately to motivate Socrates' alternative approach through positing forms as causes. These objections fall into two groups. First, after recalling his initial enthusiasm for natural philosophy, Socrates lists a series of difficulties that he fell into, which led him to conclude that he had no aptitude for this investigation and provisionally to give up on it. Then, however, he heard someone reading from a book of Anaxagoras. That rekindled his enthusiasm, but when he actually read the book, he was disappointed, and he explains that disappointment by a second series of objections. Now, while Socrates' objections specifically to Anaxagoras have remained a locus classicus for teleological objections to mechanistic or merely material cause explanations, the first series of objections before the mention of the book of Anaxagoras have been received mainly in embarrassed silence. The arguments seem sophistical. It seems hard to believe that any earnest inquirer into nature could really have let himself be deterred by them. Furthermore, the arguments seem too general. Unlike the later arguments against Anaxagoras, they seem to be arguments against any kind of inquiry into nature. It seems that if they proved anything, they would prove that the whole inquiry into nature is in vain and their grounds seem far too weak to support such a conclusion. One of the few scholars who have discussed the arguments in detail, Gregory Vlastos, uh, who some of us heard give a talk in this room 25 years ago, um, in his paper, Reasons and Causes in the Phaedo, says that for the modern reader, these puzzles are not so much puzzles as meta-puzzles, by which Vlastos means that our problem is to figure out how anyone could have been puzzled by them in the first place. That's the problem that I'll be addressing in this talk. I want to show how Plato could plausibly represent Socrates at one stage in his career as being seriously troubled by these problems, indeed so troubled that they would represent a plausible motivation for his introduction of forms as causes. I'll also try to show how these problems are connected with larger themes of the Phaedo, including the immortality of the soul, and also with larger themes of Greek philosophy. For it will become clear that these problems, or closely related ones, were taken seriously by other Greek philosophers both before and after Plato. So the crucial passage is Phaedo 96C3 to 97B3, and that's on the single-page handout. In fact, I've given you a somewhat larger text on the single-page handout. But this particular crucial portion of the text I have divided on your handout, uh, marked it up with, into sections marked Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I've divided 3A from 3B, if you can see the little letters, since uh, 3 discusses two related but distinct explanations. So Socrates starts by recalling the kind of explanations that he used to find unproblematic. A human being grows, for instance, by the flesh and bone in the food they consume being added to the flesh and bone in their body. That's case one. Then he lists other explanations that he also used to find unproblematic. 
One person is taller than another by a head, case two. 10 is greater than eight by two having been added to it, case three A, or a two cubit length is greater than a one cubit length by exceeding it by half, by half of the greater length, case three B. Now, Socrates doesn't explicitly say what's wrong with these explanations, but he does make explicit an objection to an analogous explanation, that one becomes two through another one being added to it, case four. He asks whether it's the one to which the addition is made that becomes two, or the one that's added to it, or both together. If both ones together become two, were they not two when they were at a distance, becoming two only when they're brought closer together? If so, does two come about from two opposite causes, both by something's being split, its two parts being pulled apart, and by their being brought closer together? The explanation in case four is evidently supposed to be analogous to the earlier explanations and to bring out what is problematic in the apparently innocent earlier explanations. Once we see the objections to explanation four, we should be able to go back and construct analogous objections to the earlier explanations as well. Now, Vlastos was interpreting Plato from the standpoint of a kind of common sense or ordinary language philosophy, and so he wanted Plato, like J.L. Austin, to be objecting not to common sense explanations of growth, as in case one, but only to scientists or philosophers giving oversimple reductionist schemes. So Vlastos thought that Socrates was accepting explanations of type one, and that the objections to explanation four bring out an elementary error common only to cases two, three, and four. According to Vlastos, that error was to confuse the mathematical operation of addition with the physical process of joining one thing to another, and to try to give physical causes for what can only be given conceptual or logical reasons, namely the conceptual mathematical truths that one and one is two, or that 10 is greater than eight. Now I think, and it seems to be widely agreed, that Vlastos's interpretation is untenable. What's being explained in case four is not the mathematical truth that one and one is two, but the physical fact that there are two things here, as what's being explained in case three is that this length is greater than that length, or that these 10 things are more than these eight things, just as in case two, what's being explained is that this man is taller than that man. Further, since addition, prosthesis, in Greek mathematical texts always involves joining one thing to another, never a merely conceptual relation, so a number in Greek mathematics can't be added to itself but only to another number of the same kind, uh, given, given that, it would be strange for Plato to represent this assumption, that addition involves joining something to something, as an elementary howler, Vlastos's word, that Socrates would now be blaming on his early materialist enthusiasms. Further, it's clear that all four explanations are linked by common themes. They all explain why something is larger than something else, or why something becomes larger than it itself was, or in case four, why it becomes some specific larger number, why one becomes two. In all cases, the explanation offered for why x becomes larger, or why x is larger, is that something is added to x. The objection to explanation four thus ought to be bringing out what is implicitly wrong with explanation one, as well as two and three. And if, like Blastos, you want Plato to be contesting only views of philosophers and scientists and not those of common sense, then it's clear enough that one is specifically Anaxagoras' explanation of growth, namely that each of the homeomerous substances, so uniform things, things whose parts have the same nature, have the same name and nature as themselves, like flesh and bone and blood, that each of the homeomerous substances is imperceptibly present in the nutriment from which they are separated out and added to the homeomerous substances in us. There should be a gloss on homeomerous on the second handout. While Vlastos thinks that some of these explanations are obviously true and others are obviously false, Greek philosophers both before Plato and after Plato seem to have thought that these or closely related problems, and I'll call them for short problems about growth, were serious problems that the explanations in each case are plausible, but in each case face a real difficulty. So one obvious place to turn for problems about growth is the chapter on growth in Aristotle's On Generation and Corruption. That's book one, chapter five. Uh, and crucial bits of that are on your handout, and you should be looking at them. 
So much of that chapter is devoted to a series of aperiae, objections or difficulties, against the possibility of growth. Aristotle says that for X to count as growing, rather than simply being replaced by something larger than it, the substance must persist through the change, every part of X must grow, and X must grow when something is added to it. Aristotle says, in the course of a larger argument, someone might raise the aporia, what it is that grows, whether it's that to which something is added. For instance, if something makes the shin bone grow, is the shin bone greater, and what makes it grow, the nutriment, not greater? So why haven't they both grown? For both that which is added and that to which it is added are bigger, as when you mix wine with water, for they are each likewise more. The language here is very close to the language in passage 4 in the Phaedo, which asks whether it's the one to which something is added, or the one which is added to it, or both which become two. Plato's question there is a particular case of the general question whether what grows is that to which something is added, or what's added to it, or both. But Aristotle is applying that question not to numerical addition, as in passage four in the Phaedo, but to biological growth occasioned by nutriment, so to case one in the Phaedo rather than to case four. That makes it clear, I think, that he reads Plato's objections in case four as bringing out problems implicit, not just in the mathematical cases 3a and 3b, or even the quasi-mathematical case 2 being taller by a head, but also in the clearly biological case 1. And it also becomes clear that Aristotle thinks that at least one problem Plato is raising is a problem of identity through time throughout the process of growth. As Aristotle immediately goes on to say, the reason that the shin bone grows and the nutriment doesn't is that the substance of the former remains and that of the latter, the nutriment, doesn't. In the case of a one being added to a one, the aporia is irresolvable since there's no reason why this one more than that one should be identical with the resulting two. In the case of the shin bone, the aporia can be resolved, but the explanation of the fact that it's the shin bone that grows can't be simply that something is added to the shin. The explanation must turn on something distinctive about the shin bone, as opposed to the nutriment, that guarantees its identity through time. Now, I think Aristotle is reading the Phaedo correctly. And it's not just Plato and Aristotle who have these concerns. Once we see the Phaedo passage as raising puzzles about the identity through time needed for growth, it becomes clear that Plato is developing the argument of a famous passage of Epicharmus, which is at the bottom of page one of the second handout. It's in dialogue form, and uh, you should look at it because I'm not going to read the whole thing out. Now, I've marked up the Epicharmus passage with the Roman numerals 1, 2, 3a, 3b, and 4 to bring out the correspondences with the Phaedo. So in Epicharmus, if someone wishes to add a pebble to an odd number, or if you like to an even one, or to take away one that's already there, does it seem to you that the same number is still there? That corresponds in the Phaedo to 3b. 10 is greater than 8 by 2 having been added to it, and more obviously to 4. Does the one to which another one is added become 2, which is more explicitly about the identity through time of a number? Uh, again, in Epicharmus, neither if someone wishes to add another length to a cubit measure or to cut off from what was previously there, would that measure still persist? corresponds to 3a in the Phaedo, where a two cubit length is greater than a one cubit length by exceeding it by half. And in Epicharmus, consider humans too in this way. One grows, another shrinks. All are in process of exchange at all times. What's in process of exchange by nature and never remains in the same state would be something different from what existed before. And you and I were different people yesterday and different people now and different again and never the same according to this argument. That corresponds to case one in the Phaedo, raising difficulties about a person persisting through time and growing. As we'll see, it also bears a relation to two, about a person being larger than another person at the same time, rather than about a person's becoming larger than he himself previously was. So in Epicharmus, as in Plato, you have an example of a number, an example of a length, so a cubit measure, and an example of a human being. And in all cases, there are questions about whether, uh, in what sense, they can grow or how their growth can be explained. Now, I'm not suggesting that Plato and Epicharmus 
or the character in Epicharmus who makes these arguments are saying the same thing. They're not. Rather, Plato is developing the ideas from the Epicharmus text for a new purpose. The speaker in Epicharmus is trying to argue that humans don't persist through time. According to Plutarch, and this is on page two of the second handout, according to Plutarch, he is making that argument in order to argue that he is not the person who previously contracted a debt and therefore that he has no obligation to repay it. And he's using the premise that people are always gaining and losing material from their bodies. So he starts with the clear case that a number doesn't persist when something is added or taken away. Once he's got agreement on that, he moves to the slightly less clear case of a length. The reason the case of a length is a bit less clear than the case of a number is that a length could change continuously, whereas a number could only change abruptly. So it's somewhat more plausible that a length persists through change. When the speaker has got agreement that a length does not persist through change, he moves to the still less clear case of a human being. He's trying to get you to conceive of human beings on the model of numbers or lengths and to agree that they too cannot persist through time. Now, Plato is certainly not denying that humans persist through time when they grow. Plato surely thinks that they do and that that's necessary if someone is really to grow rather than just to be replaced by someone else who's bigger. But Plato denies that an explanation of growth through addition can explain this. So Plato starts with Anaxagoras' explanation of human growth through addition, a development of common sense which initially appears unproblematic. Then he turns to explanations through addition of a person's or a length's or a number's being greater than another, explanations in which the difficulty comes closer and closer to the surface. Finally, he makes the difficulty about identity and growth explicit by ending with the case where Epicharmus began of adding a unit to a number or adding a unit to another unit to produce a larger number where it's clear that there's no number that persists through the process of growth. And here, too, there's a difference from Epicharmus. Epicharmus just takes it for granted that no number persists through growth or shrinking. Plato, too, takes that for granted in a parallel passage from the Cratylus, which is in the middle of page two of the handout. But here in the Phaedo, he supports it by an indifference argument. If one becomes two when another one is added to it, why should it be this one rather than that one that becomes the resulting two? It can't be both, so it is neither. Plato also thinks that it's in principle objectionable for a number to persist through growth, but the interlocutor or the reader might not immediately grant that. Reflection on the indifference argument might lead them to grasp the deeper in principle difficulty as well. Anyway, Plato's conclusion is that explanations through addition cannot explain growth, and that we must instead explain growth, and by implication other physical phenomena, through a different kind of explanations or causes. That will motivate the introduction of forms as causes, and ultimately, the final argument for the immortality of soul. Now, another feature that makes Plato's reasoning harder to follow than Epicharmus's is that Plato goes back and forth between explanations of something's becoming larger than it previously was, cases one and four, and explanations of something's being larger than something else, cases two and three. The question of identity through time raises a difficulty for the first type of explanation, explanations of becoming larger, but what's the difficulty supposed to be in one person's being taller than another by a head or tens being greater than eight by two being added? It seems to me that in these cases, Plato sees a problem analogous to the problem of identity through time, namely the problem of identity across possible situations. If the 10 is greater than the eight, through two being added. So I'm going to change the example so I can use my hands. If the five is greater than the three by two being added, so by these two being added, then if the two were not present, this would be three and equal to this three. If the two is present in addition, then this is five and greater than this three. That means that there's one and the same thing, which in one possible situation is three, and in another situation is five and greater than three. To put the point in a somewhat sharper way, if I'm taller than you by a head, then if you cut my head off, we'll be the same height. Right? That explanation presupposes that if you cut my head off, it would be the larger portion rather than the smaller portion, or both together, or neither, which would be me. Plato surely believes that in that circumstance, neither of the resulting portions would be me. Um, now, 
It is true that one animal might be longer than another animal by a tail. If you cut Bucephalus's tail off, it will be the larger portion, which is Bucephalus. Plato's point against the physicists is not that such statements of identity through time or identity across possible situations are never true, but rather that the physicists can't explain when and why they are true, and that lacking such explanations, they can't explain becoming larger or being larger. And you might compare Aristotle's claim in Generation Corruption 1.5 that to explain how a homeomerous substance like flesh or bone grows, you have to distinguish between bone in the sense of the form and bone in the sense of the matter, and only bone in the sense of the form is a persisting subject for growth. Presumably, he thinks that goes beyond the range of explanations that were available to Anaxagoras. What Plato is saying, in short, is that Anaxagoras cannot solve the growing argument. The growing argument is one of a standard Greek family of so-called sophisms, and that explains a legitimate sense in which we can say that Socrates' first set of objections against the physicists are sophistical. But this is a very typical and perfectly legitimate use of sophisms in Greek philosophy. To show the inadequacy of philosophical positions that cannot solve a given sophism, and to try to motivate a new position that can solve it. Now, it's not news that Plato, throughout the whole reply to Cebes, is setting out his position by contrast with Anaxagoras, not just on the issue for which Anaxagoras is explicitly cited on noose, mind or reason, and teleological explanation, but also on the causes of predication and change, causes of being F, causes of coming to be F. David Furley, in his article, Anaxagoras in Response to Parmenides, pointed out striking similarities and also striking differences between Anaxagoras' and Plato's accounts of, of predication. And uh, the crucial things are at the very bottom of page two of the handout. Both Anaxagoras and Plato think that at least for some range of predicates F, an ordinary sensible thing S, which is F, is F by participating in the F where the F here is not another participant, but something which is purely and essentially and eternally F. But Anaxagoras and Plato have very different views, both on what such purely F things are like and also on what it is to participate in them. For Anaxagoras, if S is, let's say, gold, it's so by participating in gold in the most straightforward sense of participate. So the Greek verb, metechein, means literally to have a share or portion of something. So something participates in gold by containing within itself a portion of gold. And the gold in which S participates is not another gold thing in the same way that S is. That is, it's not just something that contains some gold mixed with, all of, with some of all the other homeomerous substances. If it were, then there would be an infinite regress of such golds. Rather, the gold that S participates in is just pure gold itself. It's reasonable to think, and this was Furley's suggestion, that Plato is taking over from Anaxagoras the language of participation and the general scheme of explanation through participation in the F itself. But at the same time, he's arguing here in the Phaedo and also in the Greater Hippias, in the passage there against what he there calls the theory of continuous bodies of being, he's arguing that at least for many values of F, Anaxagoras' kind of participation and Anaxagoras' kind of F itself can't explain what needs to be explained. Anaxagoras' account is plausible if F is gold, or maybe if it's hot or cold, but it breaks down completely if F is odd or equal or beautiful. And those are all examples from the greater Hippias. If we're to preserve explanation through participation in an F itself in these cases, the F itself must not be a homeomerous substance distributed in space, but rather something indivisible and non-spatial. And S must participate in it, not by literally containing a portion of it, but in some non-spatial way. So far, I'm following Furley. What I would add is that Plato also has a critique of Anaxagoras on the subject of participation subject of coming to participate, as well as on the thing it participates in. Coming to be F, or coming to participate in F, requires a persisting subject, which first does not contain a portion of F, and later does contain a portion of F. Or maybe it first contains a smaller portion of F, and then later it contains a larger portion of F. 
And Anaxagoras is in difficulty specifying what that persisting subject is. We've seen the difficulty in the case of S's coming to be larger. But the same difficulty arises in the case of qualitative change, since Anaxagoras explains this in very much the same way as quantitative change. Socrates grows through flesh and bone and so on in the nutriment being added to him, and he becomes hotter through fire from something else being added to him, or maybe through heat from something else being added to him. But these explanations can work only if the flesh or the bone or the fire or the heat becomes part of Socrates. And Anaxagoras has no explanation of when or why this happens. It can't be enough for the additional portion of F to come to be in the same general region of space as S. Socrates doesn't become taller uh, when a stool is placed under him or a hat on top of him. He doesn't become more golden by having some gold added above him or below him. Uh, nor would he, even if the gold uh, were, instead of being added above or below, uh, were interspersed with his body or even totally mixed with his body uh, in the Stoic fashion so there was a little bit of it in each part of his body. That still wouldn't do it unless it also becomes a part of him. And Anaxagoras, who doesn't admit Socrates as one of the things, the chremata in his ontology, those are just the homeomerous substances, has no explanation of when and why this added piece of F becomes part of Socrates. Now, it's more usual to see Plato's criticism of the pre-Socratics as directed against their lack of formal cause and final cause explanations, against their lack of a conception of an immaterial thing participated in, rather than against any inadequacy in their conception of the participant. But Plato seems to think that the two go together. If the growing argument shows that we can't explain a thing's growing or things becoming hotter by the addition of something to the thing, then we must explain the effect in some other way. There must be a persisting subject S which is capable, while remaining S, either of being F or of being not F. And if S is being F can't be explained through material causes, it'll have to be explained through a formal cause instead. Uh, now, for people who have copies of the paper, as I gather some people do, um, I'll skip a two-page section, which is responding to David Sedley's different reconstruction of uh, what Plato's objections are here. So at this point, you may be inclined to ask whether this is all too subtle. Is the Phaedo really concerned... Is the Phaedo really concerned with such abstruse questions as the criteria of identity through time? Well, sure it is. The Phaedo is deeply concerned, not only with the question whether my soul will survive the death of my body, but also with the question whether I will survive the death of my body. That had been an issue for the Greeks since the opening lines of the Iliad where the wrath of Achilles sends many mighty souls of heroes off to Hades and leaves them, Autus, the heroes themselves, as food for dogs and birds. Late in the Phaedo, when Crito asks, how shall we bury you? Socrates replies, however you like, if you can catch me. And he complains to the other interlocutors that Crito must not have been persuaded by the argument Socrates has been giving if Crito still thinks that that corpse that he'll see a little while later is me. Plato is thus giving the opposite answer to Homer on what we are now, with opposite consequences for what we will be after death, and thus opposite consequences for how much we should care about our corpses being properly buried. And the dramatic moments toward the end of the Phaedo can't be separated from the earlier discussion of the philosopher's happy state after death, from the arguments for the immortality of the soul, or from the objections to the physicists. All have implications for what we are now and for what we will be. The examples of phenomena for physical explanation that Socrates raises in his intellectual autobiography are designed not only to motivate positing forms as causes, but also to motivate positing a soul, which is unitary at a time and unitary across times and is the bearer of personal identity and which will ultimately be proved to be immortal. Most directly, they motivate positing forms as causes. If S can, while remaining S, be either F or not F, and if that can't be explained by the addition of an extra quantity or an extra piece of Fness, and if we put off the hope of explaining that S is F because it's best for it to be so, 
then we will instead explain why S is F by saying that it participates in the F itself in a way that doesn't require a piece of the F itself to be added to S. But Plato also intends the difficulties of physical explanation to motivate positing souls as causes. Most obviously, while the safe explanation of why Socrates is alive is that he participates in the form of life, the clever explanation is that there is a soul present in him which always comes bearing life with it. That's presented as an instance of a more general type of explanation. If S can, while remaining S, uh, this again is top of page 3 of the handout, if S can, while remaining S, be either F or not F, we can offer the clever explanation of saying that S is F by the presence of T. It's alive by the presence of soul. It's cold by the presence of snow. It's odd by the presence of three. To avoid an infinite regress, T must be such that while remaining T, it can only be F and never not F. That is, the identity conditions of T have to depend on its being F. So uh, in the example of three, which can't cease to be odd without perishing, Plato is making use of Epicharmus' premise that a number doesn't persist when a unit is added or taken away. Of course, for this sort of explanation, not to succumb to the same problems as Anaxagoras' explanations, we'll have to explain why T becomes part of S. And it can't be part in a straightforward bodily way if T is soul or if T is three. So to explain how Socrates' soul makes him alive, it'll have to be explained how his soul and his body are united in a single person. The Socrates who is alive here can't be just his body, but it's also not just his soul, since the soul's presence in something explains why that something is alive. So Socrates here has to be the soul-body composite, but in such a way that its criterion of identity depends only on the soul. He's whatever the soul is present in, so that when the soul is separated from all bodies, he will be just that soul. However, soul is also involved, not just in explaining life, but in explaining predicates for which the presence of soul is necessary but not sufficient, such as animal generation and growth, and also thinking. Now, those are all examples that Socrates had discussed in his intellectual autobiography. So if you go back to the one-page handout and look at the section before Roman numerals one through four, and uh, the translation I'll be reading here is slightly different than what's on the handout. Is it the case that when the hot and the cold take on putrefaction, as some think, then living things are nourished? That's not really about nourishment, by the way. That's a pre-Socratic explanation of the first origin of living things from the primeval slime. And is it blood by which we think, or air, or fire, or none of these? But it's rather... It's rather the brain which provides the senses of hearing and seeing and smelling. And out of these arise memory and opinion. And out of memory and opinion, when they acquire stability, knowledge arises. Now, the reader and the interlocutors within the dialogue are surely meant to notice that all of these explanations are failing to mention the soul when the soul is needed. What causes life in a body beyond the form of life is soul, not the hot and the cold, and that's not just a clever explanation that will emerge after the physicists have been refuted. That's something that Thedo has taken for granted from the beginning. So that's why very early on in the Thedo, death, that is, a body ceasing to be alive, was defined as the departure of the soul from the body. It was assumed that the soul is the cause of life to the body. Likewise, the Thedo has taken it for granted that it's the soul by which we think, or just that it's the soul which thinks, and the sense... Sorry. and that the senses are not the causes of knowledge in the way that the physicists are here proposing. So um, the arguments for immortality from recollection and from resemblance had assumed, and indeed up to a point they had argued, that the objects of knowledge are unitary and eternal, unlike the objects of sensation, and that sensation serves only as an occasion to remind us of something we had already known independently of sensation. Even before that, Socrates had argued that the senses and the body do not lead the soul to knowledge, but on the contrary deceive it, and that we will best grasp what things are by reasoning, apart from sensation, with the soul detached as much as possible from the body. That was the reason why the philosopher shouldn't fear death, that is, shouldn't fear the separation of soul from body, but should rather welcome it as the best means to knowledge. And that was what led to the long digression on immortality, 
Since however cognitively bad the body and the senses may be, death can only be cognitively good for us if, when a human being has died, the soul exists and has some power and ability to think, and Cebes had challenged Socrates to prove that. That's how we got into the arguments for immortality. So any alert reader or interlocutor should realize that given the Phaedo's theory of knowledge, the pre-Socratic physical explanations of what we think by, by some part of the body rather than by the soul, must be badly misguided. Socrates doesn't make explicit what he now finds wanting in these physical explanations, either of the origin of living things or of thinking. However, he immediately goes on to say that he no longer thinks he understands even something so apparently simple as why humans grow. He is surely claiming a fortiori that if physical explanations can't explain even the growth of living things, they certainly can't explain their first origin, and presumably also not their thinking, which is more mysterious and less rooted in biology, less rooted in physics, than their growing is. But we might think that the difficulties against explanations of growth, which turn on the problems of identity through time, uh, would not also uh, arise against explanations of the origin of life or explanations of thinking that if these explanations fail, it would be for some other reason. However, it seems to me that if we bring together some parallel passages from other dialogues, we can see that Plato thinks analogous difficulties would arise in all of these cases. So the question, what we think by, is also raised in the Theotetus. And um, a crucial bit of that is on page two of the handout. We might naively suppose that we see black and white things by the eyes and that we hear high and low sounds by the ears. But, Socrates says, really we see and hear not by the eyes and the ears, but through the eyes and the ears. He says, and this is on the handout, it would be strange, child, if there were many senses seated within us as in a wooden horse, but these things didn't all contribute to some one entity, soul or whatever it should be called, by which we sent sensible things through the senses as through instruments. We can paraphrase the issue by saying that if we see by the eyes, it's properly the eyes that see, whereas if we see by the soul through the eyes, it's properly the soul that sees, using the eyes as instruments. Any explanation of sight and hearing that doesn't indicate some one entity by which I both see and hear will not explain why I see and hear, but, at most, why there is some sight and some hearing going on. The issue is an issue of identity. Why is it that what sees and what hears are the same thing? And even on the most materialistic accounts, thinking about sensible things will involve comparing the results of different senses. If there's no identity of seer and hearer, there will be no one to do the thinking just as if there's no identity between the newborn and the adult, there will be no one to do the growing. Now, it seems from the Thedo that some of the physicists must already have been aware of this difficulty. That's why they proposed, not that we think or sense by the eyes and ears, but that we think by air or fire, or that it's rather the brain that provides the senses of hearing and seeing and smelling. So something central, which sees through the eyes and hears through the ears, and thereby generates memory and opinion and knowledge. But it's not hard to see why Plato would have found these solutions inadequate. Air and fire and the brain are still extended bodies. If there's some air that sees through the eyes, and there's some air that hears through the ears, or if sight and hearing occur when some motion is transmitted from the eyes or ears to the brain, then unless there's some one central bit of air or brain, uh, which receives and compares the perceptions of the different senses, there'll just be some seeing and some hearing going on, and no one thing that sees and hears, and thus is able to think by comparing and reasoning out the results. And this one central bit that we're forced to posit can't itself be an extended body, or the same problem will recur. So it's not surprising that Plato, in solving the problem, will posit in the Theotetus that we see and hear by the soul through the eyes and ears, and that we reason by the soul without any bodily organ, and that he'll posit in the Thedo that that soul is not extended, but purely unitary in this respect, like the objects of pure thought, and unlike the body and the objects of sensation. 
Plato may not have had all the details of the Theotetus argument in mind when he wrote the Phaedo, but the Theotetus, as also the Timaeus, shows the sort of explanations that Plato might accept as overcoming the difficulties that the Phaedo raises for the physicists. On such an account, the soul would be the cause of thinking just as it's the cause of life. The difference would be that soul is both necessary and sufficient for living, whereas it's necessary but not sufficient for thinking. The senses and air and fire and brain would just be things that the soul uses, which provide occasions for thinking, as the ingredients of the nutriment are occasions and instruments of growth, and the bones and the sinews are instruments and occasions for Socrates sitting on the bench in prison. We can say something similar about the physicist's explanations, again not mentioning the soul, for the first origin of living things. Explaining that first origin, as the pre-Socratics kept on trying to do, is harder than explaining the reproduction of an already existing animal species, and that in turn is harder than explaining the nutrition and growth of an already existing individual animal. If materialist explanations fail to explain nutrition and growth because they can't account for the identity through time of a growing animal, they'll have even more difficulty in explaining how a primordial animal emerges. The difficulty won't be identity through time, but identity at a time. Why a single animal emerges and not just many parts. Why there's a single living thing and not just a lot of living going on. As above, why there's a single cognizing subject and not just some seeing and some hearing going on. According to the Timaeus's zoogony, the soul is older than the body, and what makes the parts one animal is that they are attached to and used by one already existing soul. So the problem then will be to explain in what sense a body can be attached to a soul. But for accounts not mentioning soul, the unity of the animal parts will be harder to explain. A good example of the difficulty is in the Hippocratic on fleshes, and I've given you a crucial bit of that um, on the third page of the handout. So uh, the Hippocratic on fleshes gives a full pre-Socratic style account of how man and the other animals arose and came to be, as he says at the beginning. Um, in the early days of the cosmos, the rotation of the heavens had separated out most of the original heat and pushed it out to the heavens, but much heat remained in various places on the earth. Then, as with time the earth was dried out by this heat, the materials left behind engendered putrefactions about themselves, which had the form of tunics. Uh, now, what was heated for a great time and happened to rise from the putrefaction of the earth as fat and contained the least moisture quickly burnt up and became bones, whereas under other conditions things became uh, cords and vessels and one thing and another. And the text continues on and on in this vein, explaining the origin not only of homeomerous parts such as bone, but also anhomeomerous parts such as brain, heart, lung, liver, and often it explains their shape as well as their material constitution. But the text says just about nothing about the man and other animals that it mentioned at the beginning. The parts are not described as functioning in a whole or as being sustained by a whole. Nothing is said to distinguish human brain from sheep brain. As far as the reader can guess, different animal species arise from the different arrangements in which things happen to be putrefying next to each other. It would be reasonable for Socrates to complain that this sort of explanation of how when the hot and the cold take on putrefaction, as some think, then living things are nourished, doesn't really explain how animals arise, but only how tissues arise, which are necessary conditions for animals. Similar things could be said against Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras can explain how bones arise from bits of bone in the environment, but he has no explanation for how an animal arises. Now, some people think uh, that Anaxagoras actually thought that each animal that now exists, like you and me, had already existed in the pre-cosmic chaotic mi mixture as a tiny preformed seed, and that it grows to full size by more bone being added to its bones and more flesh being added to its flesh and so on. That could be right, but if so, that would just underline that Anaxagoras has no explanation for how an animal can come to be and that he has to posit it as already existing. If, however, Instead of beginning the zoogonic narrative with the parts, or with matter which can be transformed to become the parts, we begin with a unitary soul which passes from a discarnate to an incarnate state, 
That's how Socrates talks in the first proof of immortality in the Phaedo. It's also how Plato talks in the Timaeus. Uh, then we'll have no problem in explaining, or no such problem, in explaining how a single animal can arise. When Socrates replies to Crito's question, how shall we bury you, he complains to the other interlocutors that I have not persuaded Socrates that I am this Socrates, the one who is now conversing and ordering each of the things said. Rather, he thinks of that corpse that he will see a little while later is me. Now, on the face of it, that's a strange thing for Socrates to say. The question whether there is identity through time between Socrates as he is now and the later corpse may well be connected with the question what Socrates is now. Is he a body? Is he a soul? Is he a soul-body composite? But to say that Socrates is the one who is now conversing doesn't seem to exclude the possibility that he may be a body. Why couldn't Socrates be a body that persists through time and that at one time is capable of conversing and at another time is not capable of conversing? But Plato's point is that a body can't converse because a body can't order the things that are said. A body might be able to produce speech sounds. We might be able to explain that purely physiologically. And indeed, the on fleshes gives a physiological explanation of speech in that sense. But that only explains how you can make sounds. It doesn't explain how you can order the things said, how you can produce any kind of coherent discourse so that the different sounds combine to signify something. To explain that, how you can order the things said, it's not enough to posit the tongue and the teeth and the vocal cords. What produces order in the things said must be some one central thing that uses the vocal cords and the teeth and the tongue as instruments of speech, just as it uses the eyes and the ears as instruments of cognition. Let me conclude. Reflection on what is involved in the explanation of human and animal life shows the need for positing a soul, and a soul which is the bearer of personal identity, unitary at a time and unitary across time. That doesn't in itself show that the soul is immortal. The unitariness of soul, by contrast with extended bodies, might support the resemblance to the divine argument for immortality. But it doesn't seem to rule out Seabee's objection that although the soul has more tendency to endure than the body, it may still not endure forever. However, Plato thinks that when, when we see how the soul functions in explanations and what it has to be like to function successfully in those, in those explanations, we can eliminate the pre-Socratic style of conceiving of the soul that makes it seem possible that a soul could perish. If soul causes life in the way that fire causes heat and three causes oddness, then a soul can't die. As Plato puts it, it can't admit death. So if, for instance, the breath in an animal, which we might be tempted to identify with its soul, can die, that shows that the breath wasn't really the soul, that there was some further soul present within the breath and responsible for the breaths and the animals being alive. The serious worry is not that the soul might itself die, but rather that when the animal dies, so when the soul ceases to be in the animal, the soul might thereby cease to exist. So nice comparison that St. Augustine gives. A light can't become dark, since that contradicts the nature of light, but the light might cease to exist when the space it's in becomes dark. So the light then would be perishing incidentally, perishing per accidents, when there is some change in its substratum. Now that's what Aristotle thinks happens to forms in general and to souls in particular. And you can't say that the possibility hasn't occurred to Plato because that's also what would happen to the harmony or the attunement when the lyre perishes or goes out of tune. But Plato thinks that he has shown in Socrates' replies to Simeus that a soul can't perish in the way that a harmony does. There were four basic arguments that the soul isn't a harmony and these are listed at the very end of page three of the handout. First, as was argued from recollection, the soul exists before the body, while the harmony can't exist before the lyre. Two, the soul can act contrary to the body in resisting its passions, while the harmony can't act contrary to the lyre. Three, that the soul can't exist in greater or lesser degrees, or can't be present in greater or lesser degrees, whereas a harmony can. And conversely, a soul can be more or less harmonious. It's more harmonious when it's virtuous, whereas a harmony can't be more or less harmonious. It can only be more or less present in something. You might say these are just arguments that the soul isn't a harmony. 
not arguments that the soul can't perish in the same way that a harmony does. But Plato thinks that these arguments point to the deeper fact that the soul doesn't have the same ontological status as a harmony, as what Aristotle would call a quality or more generally an accident, such that for it to exist is just for some underlying subject to be disposed in some way, so that it automatically ceases to exist when the subject perishes or changes. The arguments against Simeus are supposed to show that the soul can't perish in this per accidens way, and the arguments against Cebes are supposed to show that it can't perish per se, that it can't admit death. And if my soul gives my identity conditions, then I won't perish either when my soul departs from my body. Rather, uh, I will depart from my body, and I will continue to exist. Now, Aristotle, in the De Anima, accepts Plato's argument that the soul is not a harmony or any other quality or accident, so that it's not a predicate of some other underlying subject whose identity conditions can be specified without it, as a harmony is a predicate of a liar whose identity conditions can be specified without the harmony, and the liar can therefore, per can therefore persist without the harmony. Uh, so Aristotle agrees with that, uh, accepts that from Plato. Aristotle also agrees that the soul can't die, can't perish per se or admit death. And he also agrees that since my soul gives my identity conditions, if it survives, I survive too. Nonetheless, Aristotle will try to show that souls and other forms, although they are substances, not accidents, can nonetheless perish per accidents, not when the underlying composite substance persists but changes, like a liar going out of tune, but when the underlying composite substance perishes per se, and that the matter surviving but ceasing to be F can be a genuine substantial perishing of the matter form composite, and thus incidentally also perishing of the soul, and not merely the seizing to hold of some accidental or collective description. Aristotle will also try to show that our knowledge can be explained without recollection, and that the actions and qualities, virtue or vice, that Plato attributes to the soul are really actions and qualities of the soul body composite, and thus don't give ground for attributing to the soul an ontological status independent of the body. No one had proposed anything like these moves at the time of the Phaedo, and Plato can't be blamed for not anticipating. The fact that Aristotle had to make such complicated and difficult arguments to avoid Plato's conclusion, whether or not he ultimately succeeds, helps to bring out just how strong Plato's arguments were. We'll stop there.